was young, I didn't get on with my mum very much. Um, I certainly didn't respect her at times. She struggled when we were young, and not in, with the essentials, but just ways that matter when you're a child. We didn't have much, and she didn't have an education. She left school at 14, was married by 18, divorced by 26 with two children, and myself, my younger brother, came along a little later. Now, whilst there was struggles, she tried to prepare us for the world in her own way. She encouraged me to get a job as soon as I could, to have my own finances, to be financially independent, and even after I got married, she told me I needed to keep my own bank account. She encouraged me to explore the world, travel, and definitely pursue your education. She said, they can't take it away from you, Susan. And I wasn't sure who they were or why they would want to take it away. And no matter how serious the relationship got, she would always tell me, you know where your room is if you need to come home. She had lots of little antidotes like that for us growing up and some that I would often internalize as maybe her not being supportive of my relationship choices or my choices more generally, but I didn't know then what I know now. The World Health Organization suggests that one in three women globally will experience some form of physical and or sexual violence in their lifetime. Less is known about psychological and emotional abuse in this regard. Now, as a woman myself, I can absolutely assure you that women and girls do not make choices to become victims. We don't actively go out of our way to engage with us, to engage with those who would hurt or harm us, but society can often act as if we do. I'm sure that everyone here has heard of or knows someone who's been in an unhealthy or an abusive relationship dynamic and think to themselves, why don't they just leave? Or I wouldn't put up with that. I mean, who would ever let someone slap, hit, or kick them repeatedly? How do you get into a situation of rape? Can you even be raped if you're in a relationship? Surely, if you're enduring constant name-calling or braiding from a so-called partner, you must be part of the problem yourself? No. <laughs> Perhaps you wouldn't say that, but others have, and they do. I mean, I know I did to an extent when I was much younger. You see, my mum was one in three. She had experienced partner violence in her first marriage and was in that marriage for many years. And even after the relationship had ended, it had taken its toll, a major part of her that I really wanted. She told me how the psychological and emotional abuse was the worst. And even after I had learned about her history, my younger self seen it as a type of weakness. I mean, why would she let someone do that to her? As if she had a choice. Today, I'm a researcher. I spent the best part of the last decade trying to better understand the experience of victims and survivors of intimate partner violence, including the barriers that they face in leaving abusive relationships. During 2015, I spoke with groups of women who would reported their experience to the police service, and many of them had waited years before they said anything. When I asked why, they told me that they worried that they wouldn't be believed that their children would be taken away from them, or that they didn't experience the right type of abuse to warrant an intervention. You see, up until very recently in our history, we hadn't come to understand what victims and survivors already knew. Violence and abuse does not occur in a vacuum. It's not a one-off incident. Those experiences evolve over time. And it can be really difficult if you don't have the words to describe what is going on. Importantly, you don't have to be physically assaulted to be hurt or harmed. And in fact, the worst type of experiences don't require it at all. Women have shared with me their experiences over time. And a lot of them are describing what we have come to understand as coercive control. Coercive control is a pattern of behaviour that's used to dominate, intimidate, humiliate and control a person. It's often called a liberty crime because the purpose of the behaviour behind the actions of the person is generally to strip another individual of their independence. Women have shared their experiences with me of coercive control. Some, some have talked about the threatening behaviour from their partners in lots of horrible ways. 
They've threatened to hurt or harm them or their loved ones or their children if they didn't get in line. They've shared experiences of gaslighting where their partners would try to convince them that their version of reality was skewed, that they had mental health problems and they're not quite right in their mind and therefore their version of things is not the right version. Convincing others that they're the problem. They'd also shared with me their experiences of isolation. And again, this had taken weeks, months, and years to evolve. Maybe at the beginning, it was an exciting suggestion that you move away, or that maybe you cut people out of your life because it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. But in fact, what they're doing is removing you from friends, family, those that can support you and intervene. Women have shared with me their experiences of being financially restricted, restricted from healthcare, education, and more. I started to see my mum's point. <laughs> She'd been trying to prepare me should I ever find myself in that situation. Now, what we had yet to discuss was how would I ever find myself in that situation? I mean, how do you possibly become a victim of intimate partner violence? As I said, it doesn't happen overnight. Those behaviours take time to evolve. And based on your past experiences, your previous relationships and observations, what you deem to be inappropriate or unhealthy behaviour is really going to differ from person to person. Now, in 2022, Northern Ireland made a criminal offence of coercive control. But before the legislation was put in place, my colleagues and I were really interested in that question. I mean, has the public ever heard of the term coercive control and do they understand what that means? Could they identify it if they seen it in front of them? I mean, could you? We developed scenarios of coercive control, one that was really, really obvious and blatant, and the other that was less obvious, the potentially earlier stages in a relationship where there's maybe um, early indicators in the behaviour. And we shared that with adults and young people across Northern Ireland, and we asked them those very questions. Do you think this is abusive behaviour? Do you think this is going to impact the person? Would you tell a friend or a family member and would you report it to the police? Now, it was a really obvious case when it was blatant. Everyone could see it for what it was. Even if they didn't understand the term coercive control, they could see from the scenario that this was unhealthy and abusive behaviour. But with that less obvious case, that earlier stage within a relationship potentially, that's where it gets a bit tricky. People were less certain about whether this was abusive behaviour. They were less certain about reporting it and certainly not reporting it to the police. But then where would that leave us? Where does that leave the person if we are at an earlier stage in those behaviours? Perhaps we don't yet have the words, but we do know how it's making us feel. More recently, we also surveyed over 500 women across Northern Ireland, keeping in mind that's more than double the number of people in this room. And we asked them about their experiences of violence and abuse in their lifetime. 98% had reported some experience of violence and abuse in their lifetime. One of the most common experiences was psychological and emotional abuse. And this happened before, during the stage of primary school. Women reported experiences of being put down. They reported their experience of being called names, made to feel unloved, unwelcome, worthless, and much more before the age of 11. Socially, we often have this saying, which is, it could be worse. And that comes from our previous experiences. And if they're bad, then everything after that is either not as bad or it just becomes the norm. Intimate partner violence has vast impacts in terms of mental health. The women that I've spoke to have talked to me of their experiences of anxiety, depression, significant distress, suicidal ideation. If we don't know how to share our experiences, if we don't yet have the words, how then can we ask for help? Now, as part of that same study where we surveyed over 500 women, we spoke with 34 more survivors and we asked them a really important question. How can we help or intervene earlier? What can we do to prevent this in the future for others? Now, the resounding answer was in part through education. More specifically, safe and healthy relationship education. It should be delivered early in your life, it should be consistent through your life, and it should have no age limit. 
Now, I believe this to be true, not just because of my mum's experiences or because of the research, but also, at just four years old, I can see how my own daughter is already beginning to interact with the world and the people in it. Now, <laughs> becoming a mum has been humbling for me. I'm a psychologist. I trained for four years at undergraduate level. I completed my elective modules in educational, social and clinical psychology. I then graduated with a first class honours degree with commendation and studied another three years for my doctorate in psychology. Surely, I am more than equipped to manage and raise a small human. <laughs> Turns out it's a completely different skill set. <laughs> But she has become a great teacher in regards to all of this. You see, all of those academic achievements may be impressive, but they're absolutely no good if we cannot transfer any of that knowledge and understanding to real people with real lives and real experiences. I've already had some difficult conversation in play areas with parents because little boys have pushed my daughter over and they thought it cute. Oh, he just likes her or he's just being a bit boisterous. I've had those difficult conversations, and not just for my daughter, but for that little boy too. How do we expect to have safe and healthy relationships for everyone, regardless of gender, if the education, expectations and standards are not set early on? I've had to, like my mum, think of new and creative ways to teach my daughter about the world and how she may respond in certain situations as well. I mean, in our house, we often smell the flowers, and blow out the birthday candles <sighs> during those tough moments, and we all have them. I've also seen the benefits of mnemonics, so using rhythm and rhyme to help teach her things and help her remember. I mean, to this day, I can still recite all the planets using that similar technique. My very energetic mouse jumps straight under Norman's paw. Although I think it's just Norman and I due to Pluto's planetary demotion. Anyway. I want to try something new with you, if you'll indulge me today. A way of checking in with yourself in your relationships, using our head, shoulders, knees, and toes. So, we're going to start with our head. How is your mind in this relationship? Do you have any feelings of self-doubt or worthlessness due to things that your partner says about you or things that they do to you? Are you confused about how your partner treats you? Do you feel safe in this relationship? Shoulders. Do you feel like you're looking over your shoulder, tense, fearing any sort of consequence, or perhaps you have the feeling that someone has their hand on your shoulder, monitoring you, whether that's in person or online, keeping an eye on what you do, how you spend your time, and who you spend your time with? Knees. Do you feel cut off at the knees, or perhaps that your legs are cut out from under you due to things that partner, your partner does to you, or things that they say about you? Perhaps you feel like you're always on your knees, asking for forgiveness, and you're never really sure why. Maybe it's to appease your partner in the hopes that they'll treat you better. Toes. Do you feel rooted to the spot? standing alone, moving further away from friends, family, normal activities for you. And as you stand in your relationship, do you feel any element of control, like you're right where your partner wants you to be? Now, let's smell the flowers and blow out the birthday candles. You are the best indicator of your own health and well-being, and that includes your relationship with others. If you feel uneasy about your head, shoulders, knees and toes, it may be time to speak with a trusted friend, a family member or a local support service. Perhaps you feel really good in these places, but now you're thinking about someone else. Share with them and empower them too, but only if and when the time is right and it feels safe to do so. And remember that education is never out of date no matter how old you are, and you just don't know who might need you to believe in them today. Thank you.